Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this open forum session, uh, which is entitled A Wake Up Call from Nature. Um, I am Magdalena Skipper. I'm editor in chief of Nature, which is a, a multidisciplinary um, journal publishing original research as well as uh, science journalism. It's my great pleasure to be here um, leading this uh, fantastic panel. And, and being here with you as well as um, with you who are joining us uh, remotely. Just as a reminder, uh, this is an open session, so feel free to tweet or share your reflections uh, on social media. If you do so, please use the hashtag WEF22. Uh, and also there's a second uh, hashtag OpenForum22. Uh, um, a reminder about the structure of our session so we will have um, a discussion here with uh, my esteemed panelists uh, for about an hour, um, after which we'll have half an hour uh, for questions from you, from, from the audience. Uh, one thing I should share with you that um, a minister who is with us here will have to leave us after the first hour, won't be able to stay with us for the um, remaining, remaining 30 minutes. So without th further ado, uh, let me set the scene for our discussion. So a wake-up call from nature. So I rather suspect that many of you in the audience, like myself actually, are thinking that our session is mainly motivated by the pandemic, which of course is still ongoing. And I suspect that you'll be partly right. Um, we've seen, um, but this is only partly true because we've also seen um, rising temperatures in many parts of the globe, raging fires and flooding, so much so that in some parts of the globe, globe homes have become uninsurable. Um, we know from a series of um, science-based reports that our time is running out to reverse climate change and loss of biodiversity to uh, really transform the food systems also so that we may have no hunger uh, on the planet. All of this profound impact on our planet um, and, um, sin and, and on us, since we are part of the planet ecosystem, clearly impacts us as well, as I just said. But this realization um, that not, is, not everything is well is not new. In fact, it's far from new. 50 years ago already, um, we had an influential report entitled Limits to Growth, followed by Stockl Stockholm Declaration. Um, both um, emphasized the need to manage development by considering natural resources as well as economic and social concerns. So we've known for at least half a century that we need, sh we need to shift towards sustainability. Um, and yet, we are here having essentially the same conversation, only in, with much greater urgency and much greater emergency. So indeed, a wake up uh, call from nature. So with me to discuss um, uh, many issues that fit under this umbrella, um, as I said, I have an ex a fantastic panel of speakers. So I'm going to introduce them, starting from from the left here. So first is uh, David Dow, who is global shaper at uh, World Economic Forum, uh, the forest lead of uh, climate change AI and climate uh, leader at Climate Reality Project. Um, he's uh, an advisor to the UN FCCC Resilience Frontiers and a mentor at uh, Creative Destruction Lab Paris. Uh, David is also the founder of Gain Forest and an AI researcher at ETH Zurich. Um, next to him, we have uh, Marco Lambertini, who has 25 years of global conservation leadership experience. Uh, he works with world leaders, uh, corporate executives, and civil society to forge a future in which people and nature thrive. He is Director General of WWF International, uh, one of the world's largest and most respected conservation um, organizations. Uh, next to uh, him, I have Isabella Eckela, who's a, a virologist and an MD. Uh, she's professor for emerging viral diseases at uh, University Hospital of Geneva and University of Geneva. 
Um, she was a member of high-level European expert group proposing a roadmap towards stabilization of the COVID-19 pandemic in the European region as um, her interests uh, span pandemic prevention, diagnostics for emerging viruses as well. Uh, next to her uh, is uh, Vivian um, Heinen, who is the Minister of the Environment of the Netherlands. Her portfolio includes the transition to a circular economy and other environmental issues such as hazardous substances, biocides and crop protection outside agriculture, air quality, traffic emissions and fuels. She's also responsible for public transportation and bicycle policy and sustainable transportation. And then uh, finally, last but definitely not least, is uh, Stefan Dancel, who is um, CEO of Moderna, a company that today needs no introduction. Um, and um, uh, of course, thanks to the work on the developing of one of the leading COVID vaccines. And Stefan is um, a chemical engineer by training. So welcome uh, to the panel. So even though I, in the beginning I said that when we talk about a wake-up call from nature, we have to look beyond the pandemic, I would like to start our conversation with focusing on the pandemic, because of course that is at the very uh, focus, center focus, center uh, space, uh, space of, of, of our mind. So um, I'm going to uh, turn to you, Isabella, first, since you are a virologist, an expert in this, uh, in this area. And can you explain to us, um, again, what is the danger of zoonotic, of diseases of zoonotic origin? Why are we concerned that the frequency with which we see them is quite likely to rise? Well, we know that in nature, in animals, um, especially in mammals, we find a huge diversity of viruses, and among them are many which could become dangerous to us. So there are many virus families that are already known. They are very good in jumping the species barrier, so they are looking for new hosts, and when they get an opportunity, they can adapt to new hosts. One of them is the family of coronaviruses. There are many others, but these have just shown that they are really capable of doing that. And um, we know um, when we interfere with um, ecosystems or when we interfere with, um, with animal communities that these viruses then get a chance to seek new hosts or to get an opportunity to infect new hosts. And there are many different ways how this can happen, either that we invade the natural habitat, that we put livestock next to these animals, that animal species that normally are not in contact, that suddenly meet, then we create very huge herds when we have um, industrial animal farming, or it's ourselves who are moving into the forest or we're logging down the forest and we are, um, we are stealing somehow the natural habitat of these animals. And all of this creates a kind of bridge of viruses that are there that normally would not be harmful for us to come in contact either with us or with our animal species, with our pets, with our livestock, and then either we become directly infected or these animals serve as an amplifying host into the human population. And um, there is very good evidence now that there are really risk zones. So when you cut down a forest, you will have a contact zone where on the one side you have high biodiversity, you have a lot of animals, and on the other side you have farmland, you have livestock, you have humans, and in that contact zone, you really have a zone where you have the highest risk of new pathogens spilling over. It was also shown that climate change will um, force animals to leave their natural habitat, to move out, to seek to higher altitudes because they find better living conditions and also they will start to compete for habitats. And that will um, lead um, to a situation where uh, many, especially mammals, will meet for the first time that have never met before. And there is research that showed that this is already happening because of climate change, animals have to change the way they live. And this will create um, new risks for pandemics because we know there are many, many viruses out there. And if we get in contact with them or if we build such a bridge, then we could um, have the next epidemic or maybe even pandemic. So, thank you for this explanation. And many heard the term zoonotic disease for the first time mm -hmm. probably in the context yeah. of, of COVID-19. But just to be clear, the phenomenon is not new. It, the frequency mm -hmm. that is something yeah. 
we should so, be concerned uh, so about. So Nordic disease just means it's a disease that jumps from animals to humans. And there are many examples, we know this for a very long time, um, but what we have observed in the recent decades that these events, that viruses move out of their natural host and infect us or infect our livestock species is becoming more and more frequent and due to, due to globalization, the consequences of such a spillover event are much larger than, than they were, let's say, 50 years ago. Exactly. And so, actually, David, can I bring you in here? Because, um, uh, you know, we just heard um, about how, for example, deforestation, changing of, of habitats is um, increasing the frequency of these potential events, new species coming into contact, uh, changing range in the habitats. You do a lot of work uh, in the context of, of forest, uh, measuring um, forest degradation, deforestation. Um, tell us a little bit about your work and, and why it's important in its own right, but also in the context of the, of the current pandemic and potential other Epidemics and epidemics. So besides um, being a global shipper for the World Economic Forum, I'm an AI researcher at ETH Zurich, where we develop algorithms um, using satellite data, drone imagery, and also on the ground um, measurements to understand and see the changes in forest. Nowadays, it's, deforestation is one of the worst things that can happen to the planet, and it leaves huge scars on the planet. Um, you can see it by just with your with your eyes, if you look at satellite imagery over a couple of years, you do see very, very distinct patterns of legal and illegal deforestation. For example, one of the patterns we can observe from satellite data is what we call a fishbone structure, where in the Amazon, the deforestation is so large that you cut down a long road in the middle and then side roads that looks like a fishbone on, from, from, from a spatial view. And then it expands and expands, and it's estimated that we lost um, of already since the industrial age, half of the world's forest. This is important because as there's a connection to the forest itself has a connection to multiple crises that our, our planet is facing right now. The biodiversity crisis with the driving out the, um, the species out of the forest that correlates and is connected to a large health crisis, but also not a lot of people know, but the global deforestation, if tropical deforestation would be a climate emitter. It would be the third largest country in the world right after the US and China. So it's a huge impact on climate, on the emissions. It's taking too less of attention from, um, from leaders and governments in that space because there's no way everyone can agree on this that we can fulfill any of the 1.5 goals uh, the Paris Agreement has set without stopping deforestation. And lastly, deforestation is important because it's the people in the center that suffer the most. 1.2 billion people are living in the forest. They are depending on the forest as a livelihood, as communities, indigenous communities call the forest, the rainforest, their home. And they are driven out by illegal land invasions, oftentimes also getting killed by protecting the homes. Very important and, and, and powerful reminder of the many different dimensions that we have to keep in mind. We'll come back to the issue of people um, a little bit later because, of course, it's crucial in the context of, of uh, forest preservation, but also in the context of other habitats um, as well. I think that's a, an important point. But I'd like to bring Marco in at this point. So, Marco, I noticed um, that when you arrived in Davos, um, you shared a tweet. You said, we must embrace a nature-positive by 2030 global goal for nature to have more biodiversity in the, at the end of the decade than at the start. No ifs, no buts, it's an imperative. So can you elaborate on what you mean by a nature positive goal for nature? Thank you. So um, first of all, uh, one word on the context. Um, you mentioned we lost a half of the forest already. We lost also half the coral reefs. 85% of the wetlands. We have lost 70% uh, of wildlife populations uh, globally in the last 40 years. And we have one million species on the brink of extinctions. And I can go on and on and on with other statistics that show how serious the impact that we have been having on nature over the last, frankly, 60 years has been dramatic. This is what the scientists call the great acceleration of unsustainable development, 
and sustainable use of natural resources. So the trajectory is catastrophic, is as dangerous as climate change. In fact, it's connected to climate change because nature today is still buffering climate change in a massive way. Mm -hmm. A huge amount of the emissions that we produce are absorbed, neutralized by nature, forests, rivers, wetlands, the ocean. So by losing nature, we are actually beginning to affect our own lives, not just nature itself. That's the new um, eco-awakening, uh, I would say, of these last few years, where we begin to realize that nature loss is not just an ecological issue, it's not just a moral issue, because we feel strongly for having to coexist with the rest of life on the planet. It's actually an issue that touches and affects and threatens our lives, our economy, our health, our security as a society. Wars, conflicts are increasingly driven by either destabilization because of climate change or loss of natural resources. So within, context, within this context, we are advocating, and not just we, WWF, but many other organizations, in fact, even governments, that we need to embrace a clear global goal for nature like we have embraced a clear global goal for climate. On climate, everybody is very clear today. We need to drive towards being carbon neutral, net zero emissions by 2050. The whole world is aligned in delivering that. We are not moving fast enough. We are not delivering it fast enough, but everybody's clear and everybody's accountable to that. On nature, there is not such a clear direction. So that's what we want to codify in nature positive, because net, net zero for emissions is fine, but for nature, net zero is not enough. We actually need to halt the loss and we need to restore as much of what we have lost because nature has an incredible capacity to bounce back. And so nature positive in simple world, and we finish here, is more nature at the end of the decade than we have today. More forest, more fish in the ocean and in the rivers, more pollinators in the countryside, more biodiversity worldwide. Can be measured easily and can be delivered. In fact, it's not just a question if it can be delivered, it must be delivered to avoid serious consequences if we don't. Thank you. So based on what you said, I have a question for everyone on the panel. You said we must drive change. Who is we in this context? Do you want to start, Marco, since, since yeah. you made that comment, <laughs> and then I'll work my way down the panel? It's everyone, because uh, the system is broken. The production and consumption system, the development model of the last uh, 50, 60 years has been based on taking nature for granted, using resources unsustainably. Don't think, ignore the consequences. COVID has highlighted the fact that there are consequences. There are very heavy consequences, as much as climate change, very heavy consequences for our broken relationship with nature. So we is everybody, but of course, everybody has got different responsibilities. We ask governments uh, to support a very strong global agreement that drives the whole world to deliver a nature positive goal. We ask businesses to comply with a global goal and develop plants that reduce their footprint in order to become nature positive. Nature positive agriculture, nature positive fishing, nature positive uh, cities, nature positive infrastructure. All this is possible. If you have it as a goal, it's possible to be delivered. And then the consumers, us. Uh, our lifestyles, the way we live our lives, what we eat in particular, the energy we consume, the commodities we buy, that can make a huge difference. Remember one thing, every single person doing one thing multiply by at least three billion in the developed rich world plus another five in the developing world. So each individual act can make a huge difference and of course support government and business transitions as well. Thank you for this. I was just reminded of uh, when you were calling to all of us as consumers, and of course, regardless of, of, of what we do, in addition to that, we are consumers. I was reminded of a comment that was made on, a, on another panel that um, earlier today I moderated, and this was around br blue food, so food that is aquatic in, in origin. And uh, it was the Minister of Environment of Ecuador who said that they were just introducing uh, a label on menus in restaurants, especially in Galapagos Islands, 
to show the consumers the carbon footprint of the meal they were ordering. Now that is a inter really interesting way of surfacing um, how you're contributing to, to global change, of course. So I'm actually going to modify my question slightly, if I may, since we have great representation of, of uh, different sectors on, on the panel. So um, Isabel, may, may I start with you and actually ask you to, when, when I say we, well, when Marco said we, scientists, researchers are of course part of that we. So what kind of responsibility do, do sciences and re scientists and research community have uh, in this yeah. context? So I think since the pandemic, um, a lot of the perception of what scientists can do and how scientists communicate has really changed. And I, I believe it's really important that um, scientists, they leave their ivory tower and they communicate because it's nice if we have these findings, if we tell them each other on conferences, we all agree on it. But I think we have to uh, make it clear to everyone what the implications of these findings are and whether it comes to zoonotic diseases. We know already a lot. Um, we know what zoonotic diseases come from. We know how viruses spill over. This is nothing new. And a lot of that um, was already known before the pandemic and a lot of warnings were there, but they were not heard or maybe we communicated not well enough. But I think um, it's not that we need more research to understand how pandemics evolve. Of course, we need research, but I think the, the, the core principles, how, um, how new diseases can cause a problem and where they come from and what are the drivers, the core principles are in fact clear. The question is what are the next steps to take? And I think we speak a lot now about pandemic um, uh, preparedness in terms of what diagnostics do we need? What vaccines do we need? How can we become as a society more resilient um, and, and better prepared? But I think we do not speak enough about prevention of pandemics. So what does it mean? What changes in our life and what changes in, 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 in governments and what changes in industry do we need? And I think it must also be clear that this will not um, not be an easy change. It will not be an easy task. There will be some businesses who will lose money. There will be some businesses who have to change. So I think we should also address that, that it will not be easy. But in the end, this transformation will make the lives better. And in the end, um, a lot of money that will be put into that will pay off many, many times. And I think that's, that's really also something to have this long-term perspective, to know if we, it might be painful for us or we have to... Um, yeah, leave some, some practices that we like or some cultural things that we are used to that are convenient for us, but for the long term it will make our lives much better because it will our, make our lives also healthier. And I think it's something, especially me as a medical doctor working in such a field, sometimes we have this perception that health and disease is only something that happens in humans. And it's not like that. So when we think of our health and how we can protect our health, we also have to think of the health of animals and of the environment. And I think this is maybe something that is sometimes not, not really clear to everyone, that our health is really linked to the rest of the planet. And if we cannot secure the health of ecosystems, of forests, of animals, of the animals that we eat, of the animals that we consume, then we will have a very hard time to protect our own health. And I think COVID was the perfect example for that. Absolutely, really important statement. And of course, increasingly we talk about planetary health, yeah. right? living within the, the planetary yeah. boundaries that, that yeah. uh, are, create the, or, or maintain the, the whole uh, system in, in the healthy yeah. state. And I think all too often we tend to talk about us and the planet as mm -hmm. if we were somehow outside yep. of it. Whereas yep. of course we are an integral part of it. It's not sort of us and them. Yep. Uh, whatever we do to the planet, we do unto yep. ourselves. And indeed, as you say, as a medical doctor, doctors always say prevention is better than the yep. cure. So, yep. so we should really uh, be embracing that in, in a wider context. So Vivian, what about from your perspective as a minister, from a governmental perspective, what are the responsibilities? What are the key issues? Um, well, first of all, what I really enjoy uh, in this panel is that um, uh, it can be quite a difficult subject and uh, complex subject. And I think it is very important as uh, people uh, who are very 
uh, involved in it, but uh, and, and very knowledgeable that you also take your time to translate it in a way that everyone understands uh, what we are talking about. And uh, as a relative newcomer, I really understood what you were saying when it comes to uh, viruses, for example, and that's very, very important um, um, to also uh, raise awareness because I think that that is one of the first uh, responsibilities that also governments uh, have, but we share that uh, responsibility, in my opinion. And what is also very uh, important is to exchange knowledge. Um, I spoke to uh, my colleague in Ecuador as well today, and we really exchanged uh, best practices and also some concerns because they are doing very important things in Ecuador when it comes to, uh, for example, uh, creating a circular economy, uh, erasing plastics from the system because at the Galapagos Islands, they really have a big challenge when it comes to plastics and, and changing um, um, uh, habitats. Uh, but more than 80% of the pollution does not come from the country itself. It comes even from other parts of the world. So uh, we can be the best uh, kid in the class, as we would say in Dutch, uh, but it doesn't help us, especially the Netherlands being a very small country, uh, if we don't share the knowledge that we have and if we don't uh, make sure that um, we team up uh, with other big countries, with companies, and um, uh, create enough awareness that we don't have 2.7 planet Earth and we are using up 2.7 planet Earths at the moment. Uh, we will run out of resources at some point. Um, I come from a region where we had big floods not that long ago. It was in the south of the Netherlands. Um, uh, we are very specialized when it comes to water, but uh, we also use our small country very intensely. And uh, we have uh, issues when it comes to soil and water um, and management in combination with the um, well, the, the extreme pressure that we are putting on our uh, nature and on our uh, globe. And in Belgium and uh, Germany, it was unfortunately even worse. Uh, people died of floods uh, in 2021. Uh, th that's, that's what we're talking about at the moment. And we have to change our mindset. And the good thing is that um, it's coming. And um, as the Netherlands, we want to also play our part in that but we will have to do it together because uh, you cannot do it alone. Um, and uh, one of the other points of uh, attention in my, um, uh, in, in my opinion, when I'm talking about using up 2.7 planet Earths, uh, well, uh, we need to also raise awareness among consumers and uh, really make them aware, and that's what I talked to my colleague uh, from Ecuador about as well, uh, how can you make sure that everyone feels uh, part of the transition that we have to make? Because our ancestors, several uh, centuries ago, before the Industrial Revolution, they were much more in tune with nature. They lived uh, with the seasons. And I'm not saying we have to go back several centuries, but we have to raise awareness about the fact that we cannot uh, continue the way that we are uh, doing now. So um, um, uh, also investing, for example, in innovation is something we can do as a government. And that is what we do. Um, uh, we try to stimulate companies, but also universities to come up with good and better solutions. Um, and I hope that we will um, continue to do so. Very important points. And I, I particularly enjoyed your example, your reminder to all of us that you know, sometimes we think um, that global is in opposition to local, but actually your example, for example, of pollution that may become a, an acute local problem that actually has global or much broader provenance illustrates the point very well of the interconnectivity of the problems and solutions. That it's just a matter of scales, right? Local versus yes. global scale. Absolutely. Um, Stefan, um, what, what, is, what about from your perspective, from the perspective of the private sector that's been very much in the public eye, part of collaborations, conversations with governments, researchers at this intense time? What's the responsibility and the opportunity? Sure. So if you think about the we, as you described it, uh, governments, 
academia, you know, business, not-for-profit, consumers. Um, you know, I don't think we are doing enough, all of us. Uh, and as my colleague said, time is our worst enemy. And I think this is one of the notions that I think a lot of people don't appreciate, and I'll come back to it in a minute. And so I think as a business, we have to lead, and we just have to do using the best science to try to be at the forefront of what can be done. And what I really want to do with Moderna is to try to set the example to other companies, because you know companies tend to be competitive, of what can be done. Um, and we have this unique opportunity that the company is growing and it's still new. So we don't have you know, dozens of plants that have been built 50 years ago. So we're building you know, new plants as we speak, including one, for example, in Kenya. And we set very clearly the goal to the team, which is use the best material, the best technology available, you should not try to save a few million dollars. You need to do it because we're going to be 40 years with this plant, and this has to be net zero. And there's just no, no way around it. And I think, as my colleagues have said, if you set a goal, then you achieve it. As humans, we're very good at getting things done. And so you need to have a clear goal. And I think the role of business is really important because one of my frustrations as a citizen of the world is we've been talking about this climate issue for as long as I can remember. You know, I'm turning 50 this summer. Um, and I'm very disappointed in general by governments in terms of this. A lot of things we could have done for a long time that we decided because it was not popular not to do. And I think that I have a responsibility as a CEO of a company to make sure my company uses the best technology to reduce our footprint on the planet, to impact our employees and how our employees behave because they have families, they have friends. And so if said the way that is great, I think consumers uh, have a huge role to play into it. And one of the things that makes me optimistic, you know, because I'm an entrepreneur, so I have to be optimistic, uh, is the young generation. I think the young generation, and I think David is a good example on this panel, uh, gives me a lot of hope. You know, I stopped eating meat because of my 18-year-old daughter, who for actually a couple of years, <laughs> I was super slow and I apologize, <laughs> uh, and for a French guy, stopping eating meat is a big deal, you know, no more st <laughs> steak frites and other things. Uh, and I think that's something that everybody can do. You know, if you're 50 years old, you know, French guy can do it, I think really anybody can do it. It's just a question of setting the goal and then you just, you know, you just move on with your life and you can have a great life. Uh, and I think we all have to do this because if as a business leader, I impact my employees and they impact their friends and the community where we live, is step by step we're gonna get the world a better place. On the point of time, I want to make an analogy to the pandemic, which is most people do not realize that a lot of the laws of nature are not linear. And our brains are, as human, things linearly. That's how we're wired since we used to live in the forest when there was nothing else. Um, and I saw it in the pandemic and I was shocked by it because you had so many people like, yeah, it's only a few cases, only a few cases. Like, guys, can you do any modeling? Uh, because viruses go pretty fast. It's gonna be everywhere very, very soon. And I think we have the same issue with the climate, which is people think we have time. People think it's somebody else's problem. But I worry that we might even have passed the point of no return because there are so many negative feedback loop on the planet that we do not understand yet. We have to be very humble, it's like with biology. We have to be very humble, it's a very complex system and I think every day matters. And all of us, all of you guys in the room, we can all have a huge impact. So two things you said I wanted to follow up on. Uh, the first one was your statement about governments, the fact that you're disappointed with governments. So um, here's the thing, most of us live in countries where we elect our governments for a relatively short period of time. The issues we're talking about here are long-term issues. There is a discrepancy here in the sort of goals and interests of a government versus longer-term goals and interests of, of nature. Anyone on the panel, would you like to comment on this? Should we be somehow demanding something else of our politicians, of our government? Should we be electing them on a different basis? Change our electoral systems? Any comments on that? I think it's not the electoral system that's a problem here, but the people who basically elect, it's not a homogeneous mass. It's, as we said already, the we, right? It's business leaders, it's young people, it's elderly people. They have different interests that are always fighting between political candidates and the candidates who can represent them the best. And oftentimes these interests, oftentimes people who are already established from existing sectors, right? Because the cl climate change is something that disrupts a lot of old industries. These old sectors, they have a lot of power and also hold a lot of interpretation 
um, power and therefore can influence a lot in that voting system. So I, I don't think the voting system is the problem here, but it's more like how do we make people understand um, from all sectors that this is an issue um, worth sacrificing potentially profit, worth sacrificing um, um, other plans because it's so urgent that we need to address it immediately because of the exponential growth of um, the problem that we potentially can face. Absolutely, and this indeed ties in with, with the second comment that you made that I wanted to just sort of amplify here for, for, for the panel maybe to comment on. And that's this issue on, of time combined with linearity. If we look at, you know, again, coming back to the, the title of our discussion, a wake-up call from nature, you know, the, the, the nature alarm clock has been ringing for quite some time now, and yet we, we sort of asleep or half asleep. The pandemic came, and the, the intensity of the problem made us do actually quite amazing things together, right? It's not perfect, let's not get too excited, because of course there are parts of the world which fared much less well than others, but we did do amazing things collectively, and collectively across the sectors and, and, and across the, the globe, uh, at least parts of the globe. And yet, we have another huge emergency, in, well, have, we have many, but of course, you know, climate change is probably the, the, the most obvious one. But because it unfolds with a different dynamic, we somehow stay asleep. So, as you just said, David, how, how do we convey that sense of emergency? I mean, many have tried, Interesting question. Um, any, Marco, are you sitting yeah, forward? Uh, <laughs> this is a topic I absolutely love uh, uh, because it does really uh, 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 connect to, to, to two major weaknesses of, of, of our species. First of all, we have been evolving ourselves under the same natural laws of any other um, animal. <laughs> it's not like we're special. And we've become cultural very, very recently compared to our biological history. So we still have inside, and I am a great believer of, of, of behavioral genetics in many ways, uh, we, we still have inside the urge of hunters and gatherers like we started in the very early days. With the difference that we're living today in a capitalist development economic model and in a highly powerful technological society. So um, the only way to and that has happened in the last 70 years with uh, the promotion of technology uh, and the rise of capitalism. Uh, we've been uh, hitting nature very heavily. And by the way, we have also exacerbated inequality in the world at the same time. Um, so how do we mitigate that, that natural, unfortunate, natural urge uh, to gather resources <laughs> and not distribute? Uh, by understanding that it is a threat. And I'm saying this publicly, which is a little bit tricky because it's a bit provocative, but actually in natural laws, the survival instinct of any individual, of any, almost every species, reacts very strongly to a threat. Because a threat is what makes you feel for your life. And so that's, I think, what's happened in COVID. Uh, I'm Italian, uh, I wasn't in Italy at the time, but my family was. Italy was one of the first country hit in Europe, very heavily with a lot of casualties, as you remember. Mm -hmm. I never seen Italians more compliant <laughs> <laughs> with regulation and laws than on those days. And I say this with great respect and great admiration for my own uh, compatriots, because, uh, and because people were very worried, very worried. And so I think we need to, uh, go back to what I said at the beginning. We need to really internalize that climate change, nature loss, uh, from overfishing to use of pesticides, the way we deforest uh, in order to uh, grow our food, et cetera, et cetera, are all things that ultimately are going to hit us. They are a threat to us. They are an existential threat for humanity. More than what us, our children, in fact, but you know, not longer than that. The, the horizon of the impact is very close. So I think we have to culturally overcome our unfortunate, maladapted natural instinct 
that was okay when we were living in the forest like any other species, but now that we live in such a powerful society able to alter geophysically the planet, not just biologically, um, we have to just internalize that and refrain, um, r constrain our, our behaviors, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, that's what we need to change. The way we live, that's the big systemic change uh, that we need to see happening soon. Can I respond to that? Uh, because I think that's a very good analysis. Um, uh, what is very important when taking measures also as a government is public support for the measure measures that you're taking. And uh, politics has become uh, somewhat faster uh, over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, people also change faster. Um, and it used to be the case that people really chose for a political career, but now it is uh, people are relatively short in, in office. And uh, the problems that we have take a lot of time also to analyze. I mean, I only started very recently. I'm very passionate about the topic, but I still have a lot to learn. And I also hope I will have the time to really make an impact. But I will need time. I need to uh, invest in my network and I need to learn from everyone, for example, here at, World, at the World Economic Forum, um, to see how I can really make an impact back home and to also translate it uh, to the rest of the world and to, to help them. Um, 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 take some extra steps. And in order to do that, I think it is also very important for us politicians and uh, companies uh, and, and um, also academics to take everyone along in the transition. And that means informing them, but it also means, I always say, if you live in a uh, rented home uh, which has single glass, uh, which is uh, badly isolated, um, you cannot afford solar panels on your roof and you have a gas bill that goes literally through the roof, as I said earlier today, then you don't feel part of the transition that we're talking about today. Um, so we always have to keep an open mind to the people that are uh, being forgotten. One of my colleagues uh, I spoke to earlier said we should leave no one behind and I think that is really uh, the case in this transition that we're going through very important point which actually brings me to a topic which we touched on before and this is something i know that david you work with um indigenous people people who live in the forest and you know a second ago we were talking about bringing everyone along on this journey regardless of where they are in society and, and what their capability is um it's important that we remember um that we bring along the indigenous people, people who live in local communities, be it in forests or in, in the countryside in general. Um, tell us a little bit about that engagement and in turn, what we can learn from those communities, how those communities can guide us in listening to nature. Maybe a little context on this. So I, like Isabella, actually was, or still see myself as an inspiring scientist, scientist so I'm I don't expect myself actually to sit here. Um, over the last years, I've joined the COP um, United Nations Climate Change Conference um, by just random coincidence, as an, first as an engineer, joining some random student event, then looking more and deeper and deeper into the issues that are on this international level. Um, first as a scientist trying to explain with the V, okay, good, we have this technology, there's a climate urgency, I, I, I'm young, I'm gonna get like a lot of these effects, um, why don't you understand me? Understanding slowly, okay, different people, different uh, interest groups speak different languages. Some people, like young people like to speak about the urgency, but other business oriented people like to speak about the price and threat is, for example, experienced differently. Um, for example, a threat to your current business model is potentially greater than the existential threat our planet is serving. So we are in this panel, we are of course um, like fortunate enough to see the threat as the existential threat in the planet. But I can promise you that not everyone agrees on this existential threat as well. And this really pushed me towards um, moving out of the ivory tower of science and trying to understand why people don't, don't get it, right? And when I was attending these COP sessions, I realized that just learning about the facts of nature, which is one of the least appreciated 
areas where we potentially have the most impact in climate, but the least, one of the least financed in all of climate finance, like literally three, four percent of all the climate finances goes actually into nature, um, that the people who decide these climate finances are also not the people who steward nature. Like it's, like if you, if you look at the numbers, indigenous communities and local communities in the global south, they make 5% of the world's population, but they protect 80% of the um, world's terrestrial biodiversity. That's an insane number. They, and, but if you walk around Glasgow, Madrid, Bonn, um, all these climate conferences, they're barely having a seat on the table. That's why the climate youth movement like Friday for Futures is trying to have indigenous people walking in front of the protests such that photographers and journalists can take pictures of them and they still don't take the pictures of them. They rather take pictures of Greta. Greta's not speaking and uh, leaving them to speak and still they are getting ignored. And my, my work is basically very much trying to see, okay, they, they are a rich community protecting us from, from a climate catastrophe where, for example, uh, using my scientific connections, I work with um, the Kayapo people in Brazil. They are protecting a connected forest area in the Amazon rainforest that is the size of Iceland. Um, they are 10,000 people. It's one of the highest deforested rates of forests in the world. If you burn down that forest, it will be the emission of the United States in a year. And they are having trouble raising funds, having trouble getting their voices out. I mean, look around there. Rarely, in, we do, don't see a lot of indigenous people around in, at, the, at the WEF as well. So really, really, really what's important here is to not forget who are the real superheroes that are protecting us right now from a climate catastrophe um, bomb through nature, people who are protecting at the front lines, people who have contributed the least to destroying nature on the climate catastrophe, but suffering the most from its effects, from the changes, from, from destruction of nature, also from the inequality that we experience here. And th this is basically um, also the reason why I decided to sit here and tell you about this story. And, and what is the best way to, so they are clearly engaged because that's their life. What's the best way for us to bring them to the table, to the discussion, so they can inform our own thinking for what needs to be done and how it needs to be done? I think one of the most important parts is to understand that um, indigenous wisdom is often differently expressed than scientific Western wisdom. Um, but there's so much value in it. For example, we, uh, we did a paper with uh, an indigenous colleague in, um, and she was um, talking very, very in, in, in an eye perspective and, uh, about how to best preserve and restore forests and replant areas. And she was talking about, for example, this flower needs to be in this area because of sunshine. And we literally, without um, looking too much, and it's also a little bit our fault in South America, things are done very hectically, and we didn't have time to double check her essay that she submitted. We had really, really bad feedbacks from reviewers saying, who did you hire to write this, this report? Okay, making, making this flower, like uh, humanizing this flower, right? Because this is not the, the scientific language you're using. But me, on the other hand, thinking, okay, yes, okay, this reviewer potentially would never know as much as this person who's like planting and taking care of these flowers, but the language and the acceptance for this knowledge is missing, right? So one of the things I think is really important for us is to understand that these people have um, doing a tremendous work, suffering the most, and we do need to emphasize this every time we um, work with nature, we, we talk to our policymakers um, that, hey, we already have a really, really good steward there, just let them behold the land, let them do what they can do best, like we let business do what they can do best if we have the right incentives for like a clean transition. And so that goes back to the comment that uh, Viviana ma made earlier about exchange of information, right? F across different uh, stakeholders, perhaps speaking different language, but recognizing that different stakeholders can make a, a contribution. Please go ahead. I just wanted to comment on that. So I think one problem is maybe also that nature is seen um, as something that is free, that doesn't have a price. But um, we know, for example, um, in, in when you work, for example, on viruses or on, on, on antivirals or on substances, that um, we maybe still have a lot of unknown, um, um, let's say, substances, plants, 
um, mechanisms in the wild that could also help us for medicine. So for example, it's known that in rainforests, due to this high diversity, maybe the next antibiotic comes from there, or maybe the next drug that is effective against cancer comes from one of these plants. And um, we were, I mean, we would be willing to pay a high price for a drug or for a vaccine or maybe for a new technology, but because it comes from nature, we consider it not really worthless, but we don't really see the price of this resource that we have. And I think that that's maybe also something that that could be enforced, that protecting this will also um, give us something back because we might discover something new. Um, and also we know that forests and also ecosystems, they, they work like a buffer against diseases. And we know that preventing a disease is much cheaper than having to deal with a disease. And I think that, that might be also one aspect that, that we don't really value what is out there. Absolutely. Marco? That's a fundamental point. I think we are just not valuing nature. We are not pricing nature. Uh, bees never send out an invoice, uh, and we should pay uh, for the pollinators uh, uh, that produce uh, two-thirds of our food. Uh, and, and back to your comment, Minister, I think it's super important. We need to, that's exactly what we are. We are in the middle of a transition, at the beginning of a transition. We need to support the transition, but uh, uh, we need to support it by valuing nature, but also I have to say, we need leadership. It's true the government needs the support of the people, but also government is supposed to be leading <laughs> as well, uh, like businesses, uh, like civil society, like every, everyone in our own space. Um, and uh, you know, we are still in this crazy situation where there are $1.8 trillion spent by governments around the world, including the European Union, for subsidies to uh, uh, sectors like agriculture, fishing, forestry, energy, that are actually supporting nature negative activities. And it is possible to redirect those subsidies towards nature positive activities. It is possible. It's still spending money, is not letting people down, but it's spending it in a different way. I know it's not easy. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I'm not making this simple. But, uh, but that's where we need to come together. And, and, and ride this moment of, of, of awareness, because people are beginning to be ready to that transition. Uh, uh, you can see on energy more, more than anything else, but on food, it is also possible in agriculture. So that's the time. And I may be worried. I'm going to make a comment on, on the war um, uh, of Russia and Ukraine, because um, uh, uh, there is a massive destabilization of the food system, inflation going up the roof. Uh, uh, it's a long, it was a long time that a war wasn't involving big economies, a big supply chain players like uh, Russia and Ukraine. And so we are all feeling the pinch and the most vulnerable countries even more so uh, around the world as usual. Um, but uh, but uh, we need to be careful at this time of crisis like COVID or like the war, not to go back, not to fall into the temptation to say, oh, this is scary. Let's invest in intensive agriculture. Let's invest in more drilling of oil and coal in Europe. Poland has just proposed to start again the trading of coal within Europe. I mean, we have to stop coal. Coal is the dirtiest of the, of the fossil fuels. So we should not go back. We should take the opportunity of a crisis, whether it is a pandemic, whether it is, unfortunately, a tragic crisis like the one in Ukraine, to actually move forward, not to move backwards. Absolutely, and then the, the question then becomes, how do we leverage that synergy of leadership from governments, but then the industry, the, the sort of the private sector, so that the, the funds go where they should go, as opposed to in this retrograde fashion that you just gave an example of one proposition, um, and the, 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 the societal uh, direction. We don't have an economist on the panel, of course, but, but that will be a, another, another interesting voice. We are actually coming to the end of our allotted time for this conversation. But before we wrap up, um, I wanted to ask each one of you to um, give your recommendation or your wish. You know, we all agreed with the fact that from each of your perspectives, from our collective perspective, we know very well that, you know, as I said earlier, nature has been ringing the alarm clock for a long time and we know we're in trouble. We also know time is running out 
And we also know the problem is not linear, as Stefan said. So, so it's an emergency situation. What is the single thing, do you think, would make the biggest difference in us collectively sitting up and taking action? Not just talking about it. We've been talking about it for a long time. Stefan, I'm going to start with you. So I will not respect the rule. I'm going to propose to one of the things around what we eat. So I just say if we just all stop eating meat, I think there will be a huge impact right away. Doesn't need any law, doesn't need anything, it's just behavior. And the other one is around use of energy. You know, you, you can decide when you buy a car, do you, first do you need a car or not? You know, can you go by bicycle or public transportation or whatever? And what type of car you decide? This is all things we do ourselves. Thank you. Vivian? Well, I think one of the things we really need to do is raise awareness of the um, uh, situation that we are in and the role that everyone can play themselves in uh, transitioning towards a new and more sustainable uh, model that uh, the, the earth can manage. Um, and as a government and as governments, I hope that we will continue to innovate and stimulate innovation um, and uh, obviously, and I completely agree, leadership is necessary uh, from a government perspective, but I would say from all uh, levels. Um, it's important in academics, it's important in business life, it's important when it comes to NGOs, and it's important when it comes to um, just uh, inhabitants of this uh, planet. Everyone has to step up and uh, take a, a responsibility. Yeah, I can only agree with Stefan. So I think if there's one thing that every one of us can do, it's probably what we eat and it's probably stop eating meat or eat less meat because we know there are many effects of livestock, building a bridge for new pathogens, um, also increasing antibiotic resistance. So it's something we did not talk about. It's not a virus. It's also sometimes called this, the silent pandemic because it's yeah. not so obvious, but it's a huge problem. And it also helps to make better use of the land that we have already for land use, so not to increase that. It's probably the biggest thing that everyone can, can do. And it's easy, I think. So there are many alternatives now. Absolutely. Marco? Yeah, definitely food. Uh, food production on land is driving 80% of deforestation today. Simple as that. And uh, overfishing in the ocean is equally destructive. And so definitely sustainable food. David? Food was mentioned, so I'm going to raise another issue, which is climate funds. So we've been promised, pledged, pledged, pledged over the years, $100 billion for climate. The countries and governments have not delivered any of these numbers anywhere close to it. The, one of the best ways to stop deforestation, it's clear, is to pay and support these local communities, indigenous communities, and global south countries in having a sustainable alternative that they, they can... I mean, it, there's no evil player here. It's really like there are no options. And with money from the global north that can support the global south, we could create new economic opportunities that don't require to destroy the forest. And the money is missing. Push your governments, raise awareness, because this is only like <coughs> not going anywhere if the money is not flowing. Thank you. So very interesting. We had a number of um, calls here just now. Certainly um, raising awareness... Um, innovation were mentioned, but by far and away, almost all panelists agreed that actually where we can really make a difference is something that each one of us uh, has control over, really voting, so to speak, with your feet. Uh, change your diet and uh, we will make a huge impact on the planet. It's actually very simple, but so effective. Incredibly, in my view, it's an incredibly encouraging message, actually. It was so empowering as well. So with this, I'm going to pause our discussion because unfortunately, uh, Minister uh, Heinen is going to have to leave us for other uh, duties. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So much, and Thank I, you. I so I'm going to open up for questions from the floor. Uh, please, if you have any questions, there's a microphone. There's a question already here in the front row. Please. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here. I'm very excited <clears throat> to, uh, to take your insights uh, back to my organization and, and figure out what we can do better. Um, 
My question is on uh, the topic of the cost of sustainability, and not necessarily from an investment or transition perspective, but from the perspective of the consumer. Uh, and I know the, the topic of, uh, of food choice came up, uh, which draws a, lot, a nice parallel. Um, I'm from New York, um, and uh, prices may vary, but if I want to uh, get a salad, it's going to cost $15 versus a cheeseburger that costs 99 cents. Now, those with the means have the ability to choose between the cheeseburger and the salad. And similarly, those with the means have the ability to choose uh, more sustainable, but often more expensive products and consumption habits. And so, uh, as Marco mentioned, uh, the three billion people in uh, developed countries versus uh, five in developing, uh, there are obvious implications around reducing the price point. Uh, for sustainable uh, options. And so I'm curious if uh, any of the panelists have um, any insight around what is being done or, or can be done better in order to make uh, sustainable consumption more affordable. Excellent question. Would anyone, Stefan? We needed the minister because this is what, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what governments really had to normally regulate. But maybe Stephen. Yeah, I mean, there's a few things we can do. I mean, one is local farming and eating in season. I think we have become part of a 20th century culture to want to you know whatever we want all year long. And this is what drives, as you know, a lot of the cost. So I don't know if we're going to really have a way to go and fight the 99 cents burger, <laughs> because unfortunately, that's what it, they, they cost. But I think if we can really help a local community you know, to, to create farms and eat what is in season, I think you start to make a step forward. I would highlight again the regulation dimension and I think the intervention of governments from, from subsidies to redirection to actually capping some of the cost. Uh, you know, what happened right now with the cost of uh, fossil fuel? Um, it's gone up, everybody feels the pinch. Uh, in some countries really is bringing down the, the uh, 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 livelihoods of, 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 of poor families that can't afford those prices, yet Shell has tripled their profit in the last three months. Tripled. So there's something wrong here. And I think government needs to step up. Maybe one aspect is also if you would calculate uh, the true price of this piece of meat in this burger, it would not be 99 cents. It would be much, much higher if you would calculate all the costs it has on the environment, on producing animals at such a cheap price, on the, the risks that you have maybe because you need antibiotics, you have all uh, the waste from this farm, then the true price would be much higher. So I think in the end, it, it's not a natural given that the prices are like that, but it's a, it's a factor of decisions and of regulations that it's possible to produce something like that at such a cheap price. Sorry to, to intervene again, but for example, en renewable energy, thanks to uh, a mix of government uh, intervention, the global goal on climate, and of course, investment from the private sector, uh, solar energy that 20 years ago was unaffordable, today is competitive with coal for sure, it's cheaper than coal, and it's uh, cheaper in many places than oil and gas. So it can happen, it can happen. The transition can happen if uh, both corporate sector and, and governments align in making it happen. I join the opinion of my fellow um, panelists. I think it's probably unpopular to hear, but it's like some things have to be more expensive in order to make sure that the market's actually correctly reflected, for example, we take all the services, a, a beautiful natural forest um, thus far as, for example, clean um, air, clean water for granted for free, and that's not reflected in any of these markets for cheap, cheap meat, right? And if we would put the real price, if we can measure that mm -hmm. and put the real price into the economy, you will see that things are much, much different. Absolutely, but thank you for the question. I think it's a really, yeah. really important question of the affordability of, of sustainability, and, and I think Minister made that a related comment when she was talking about somebody who lives, for example, in rented accommodation doesn't have the choice of energy supply and so on. I, I think that's an important question. And of course, indeed, us putting pressures on our government um, who can regulate or help regulate this, for example, through taxation, in addition to the other uh, suggestions that, that were made. Are there any other questions or comments from the floor? There's a question here in the middle. Thank you. I think most of the inventions we had in the last 60 years at least are mainly driven by economy, by economic interests. And 
we start realizing that not all of them are favorable, are advantages to us, to ourselves. This Lambertini said the last 60 years were the worst in developing of humanity. I can understand that. As nature worked up to date, an overpopulation was main, in, mace, in most cases corrected by fighting it. So I question whether fighting COVID-19 was such an advent, uh, advent, advantageous to our mankind because we think the main problem finally is that human beings are too many or got too many in the last 60 years. A challenging um, uh, intervention there. Would any of my panelists um, care to comment? I'm happy to go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is an important question and there is no doubt that the population growth of the last uh, uh, 60, 70 years uh, have been uh, a cause of the growth of the footprint. But particularly because the consumption model, particularly <coughs> in the richer world, was completely unsustainable. And so uh, it is the number of people, but even more so the consumption level uh, in some parts of the world. The two combined has created the problem that we're facing. But still remember, that billions and billions of people in the world today are not having the same footprint of the North. And so we need to keep that in mind. But there is no doubt the population, we've been adding a billion new people to the planet every decade for the last four or five decades. So there is no doubt that this is a dimension, but it's not the only one. We need to focus on consumption as well, particularly consumption now. And, and we, we, talk, and we touched in our conversation on, on circular economy today, and of course, through, throughout uh, the past 60 years uh, that were just mentioned, uh, we had a focus on constant economic growth. And proponents of circular economy will, of course, uh, say that nothing in nature grows without limit. There are cycles of growth, but there are cycles of attrition. So why w should we expect that our economies will grow an infinitum? And indeed, uh, reflection on that, I think, is, is very very important. There was a, a question right behind you, I think, yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, reflect on a memorable phrase um, from earlier, which was unsustainable development, um, and acknowledge the role that development with a capital D has actually had in um, contributing to the degradation of nature and biodiversity. Um, to take an example in small island developing states, which are kind of at the, the forefront of uh, the, the climate emergency, um, the model of development that has um, prioritized um, monoculture and has forced populations to move to coastal areas has actually been a big factor in that. Um, and so whilst I, um, I really appreciated the final thoughts from the panel on, on what we can do as consumers. I'm actually interested to hear what you think we should prioritize in terms of systems change. So, you know, the, the response to the, the pandemic, of course, and um, there were a lot of successes, but it was also characterized by um, vaccine nationalism um, and a lack of international financing from the multilateral system that, you know, is set up to provide just that. Um, and so if we are to actually tackle this this problem, we're going to need a really focused, shared agenda. Um, so what do you think that should look like? Great question. Anyone? I maybe don't have a good solution, but I think what the pandemic has shown that um, we can have vaccine nationalism, but as long as the virus is circulating somewhere else, we will have a variant and that we are all in this together and that we cannot buy ourselves out of this problem. And I think it's the same with climate change. Of course, rich countries can maybe delay the effect of all of this, maybe for one more generation, but sooner or later it will hit them. And I think, I mean, the pandemic maybe was a good or a bad example. I think it has both sides, but it has really made it clear for all of us that there is no, sort. I mean, there are no islands. We are all in this together and we have to decide on 
on a common way to get out of this. But I think there's also a positive aspect because right now there is a lot of negative feedback. Deforestation leads to more pandemic, climate change needs to pandemic, consuming meat needs to leads to pandemic, leads to deforestation, leads to climate change. So it's all together, but it also means on the other hand, if there are solutions, then one solution, a solution for one problem would also help to solve the other one. So I think this is maybe also a positive message that maybe is not communicated enough that we, if we find the right way and the right tools that we will solve a lot of problems at the same time. And I think this is really a very nice prospect and that should somehow motivate everyone to, to work on that. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I think, you know, the, the, the call to change our diet, which actually was, mm -hmm. was you know, made by <coughs> almost every panelist earlier, in some way offers a system solution because by choosing our diet to shift away from eating meat, we are affecting land use, we are going to contribute to reducing climate change, we are going to contribute to, to greater diversity, which of course is often in opposition with agriculture and so on. So sometimes simple solutions can be truly systemic. But I think your question is really important, that we have to focus on the interconnectivity uh, of, of these problems, and then again on the local and global scales. Absolutely. Any other comments? There's a, a, a hand there. Hi. Um, I'm working very hard with my NGO to nudge people to um, see sustainability in a positive way and that it can also be uh, fun. Um, but uh, we're struggling um, and I've heard some really great uh, positive examples from you guys, but maybe to draw uh, a bit more inspiration, would you have more to share <laughs> here? It's a polite and way to say that we failed to yeah. provide <laughs> uh, stronger <laughs> arguments. And, and can I just ask you, before, before you surrender your microphone, um, why are your what what are the main causes of of sort of reluctance to see sustainability as a positive thing that, that you've experienced um i would say skepticism somehow um i had a conversation yesterday with somebody who owns its private jet um and we had actually a very good open conversation um about this and he also told me, I really feel that only when people uh, along the value chain are all economically motivated, change will happen. Um, and there are, there are only a few people like you who kind of do it intrinsically. And uh, yeah, I, I get a lot of that. However, when I do interact or when we with our organization do interact with people, um, we do see sparks and we do see change. Um, but the scaling up is, is difficult somehow. Go ahead. So economic motivation, do we really yeah, need I, that? I, I wouldn't say only economic motivation, but um, motivation based on benefits, on something that you receive back and that you feel is a positive contribution to your life. I mean, we are all here to try to live a better possible life in the respect. The question is, do we need to do that? in the respect of everybody else so uh, and, and the planet. That's the mind shift. But, um, you know, um, I've been involved many, for many years, um, when I was younger in particular, directly with local communities in Europe, elsewhere, to, for, for example, create protected areas. Creating a protected area is a, is, a, is a difficult discussion at the local level because you're going to protect, conserve, restrict, to some extent, access of some sort, even in Europe. Uh, uh, you know, you can't build houses in a protected area, so you can't make money out of this kind of activities, for example. And so there is a sort of opposition to that. But at the end of the day, uh, 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 the protected area, if the protected area is able to provide benefits, could be recreational, could be income from tourism, could be uh, access to sustainable uh, uh, resources for indigenous people, for example, they manage the protected area, then the benefit is an incentive, a strong motivation to make that decision, to actually protect rather than utilize. And so it is about benefits at the end, but there needs to be benefits compatible with the, with the, uh, uh, with the planet and with the society at large. 
And so uh, I would agree, it, but it's not just economy, it's more than that. You, nature provides so many more services than just material services. Inspiration, beauty, relax, healing. It's so important for many, many things. As a, as a young person, we, we do suffer, uh, uh, not necessarily just young people, but like the term that is often mentioned is eco-depression, eco-anxiety. Things are looking very dark because we do know the science nowadays and we do understand that it's getting very, very difficult with our personal sacrifices of building a better world and like preserving what we have. But I want to remind you of um, these benefits by reminding you of the pandemic. Um, when Switzerland had a pandemic and we had the lockdown, it was the forest that gave me back like my life energy, like everything was closed, but walking through the forest, being in nature, hiking around the country is the most beautiful, refreshing thing that one can get when, man, when you're sitting all day at home and having nothing, lost all the consumption power, right? And that's the world we want to build. And that's the world we want to preserve. If, so if we, even if we probably don't make 1.5, if we are trying to build transition to green energy, protecting more forests, regaining more nature in our cities, that's a beautiful place to live in. Just remember, mm -hmm. this is, like, it inspires us, it gives us fresh air, clean water, and it doesn't even ask for a check for this. Want to come in? Yeah, Please. so I, I sometimes also think that, I mean, people are lazy and people like to continue the way they live because you don't have to think about it, it's convenient, it's like you've always did it, and I think sometimes it's just about making choices easier. So if you live in a city where you have nice bike lanes, if you have a place where you can leave your bike, it does not get wet, then you're more likely to take the bike. Or if you have a canteen, where you have choices between different types of vegetarian food, then, you know, I think sometimes it's just having the choice or making it easy for people to make the right choice. And I think this can be very small, pragmatic things. Or, uh, for example, during the pandemic, a lot of people realized that it's also nice to, uh, to go on holidays within their own countries and not take the plane. And I think there are a lot of small things that sound maybe trivial to us, but if everyone does it, or if you just make it easy for people to do that, then, then you, can make a you can make a difference just by making it easier for people to, to take their choice. Absolutely, I, I can um, share with you, I won't, I can share with you my personal experience of discovering two amazing areas in, in the United Kingdom where I live, which I would have never discovered probably otherwise. But Stefan, I wanted to bring you in because you spent obviously the you know the pandemic in many different discussions with businesses with governments with philanthropists etc cetera, etc cetera. what's your experience of bringing people to your perspective to your point of view which is in effect what you were saying in, in a specific case of i think the the difference between the pandemic and the climate is as as david was saying people all felt the urgency as I said you know, in my first comment, my biggest worry is most people don't appreciate that we don't have any time. And so in life, when you think you have time, then you become lazy, uh, as was said before. And, and the analogy I will make, for example, on switching your diet, which is not hard, it's like wearing a mask. You know, I wore a mask during the pandemic, not because I thought I was gonna die. I'm 50 year old, I'm pretty healthy, but so that if I got it, I didn't give it to somebody that I could kill, literally. And so is this kind of civility, and I think as a world we're becoming you know, very on our phone and very individualistic and so on, is, and we lost sense of community. Look where humans used to be, you know, used to be in villages and everybody used to know each other. Everybody used to take care of each other, especially the elderly or the sick, because that's what the community used to do. And now we don't do that anymore. We do that as a society and we do it very well most of the time, but we don't do it ourselves. You know, one of the things you know, I'm trying to push the team at Moderna to do is to volunteer. And we give away hours, so people can volunteer and get full pay and so on. And I try to lead by example to go volunteer in the community, you know, cleaning the river, or you know, going to the kitchen for the homeless. Because as I like to tell employees, I say, how do you expect to live in a nice community if you do nothing for your community? Most people do nothing for their community in terms of their time and engagement. Some people do amazing things for their communities. But again, it's the type of thing that if we all do a little bit for the community, and we all live in great communities. And as, as I see the climate and the planet, is, this is the, the extent to our community. This is where we live. We cannot live without the planet. The planet is going to be okay. It might take you know, 
100 million years to get back to a good state, but the planet is going to be okay. The human species won't be okay. Yes, absolutely. And, and the, the point about the community is actually reminds me of, a, of another session I attended earlier today, and that session was on mental health, and of course how important the sense of community and the health of community is for mental health, and that, um, although not necessarily directly related to a, a wake-up call from nature, is certainly going to affect how you respond to that yeah. call. But, but, but as David was saying, I mean, a lot of people we discovered walking in the forest or parks during the pandemic, and a lot of people, you know, were not in a good place from a mental health standpoint. And I told everybody, including our kids, you know, which was now 18 and 19, they get out uh, during the pandemic. I was like, I, I like to remind people, we used to live in the forest from a biological standpoint, because, you know, I, I believe, like Marco, that, you know, our genes have massive wiring in how we behave and how we feel, is we used to be in the forest. So just seeing trees, seeing plants makes us happy. But when you're behind your phone and then you're in your car, and then you are in an office, or you don't see you don't, you don't see nature. You know, one of the reasons I love to go to work, I walk to my office. I don't own a car, uh, and I cross the river in Boston, between Boston and Cambridge, and just seeing water and seeing trees and hearing birds, it only makes you happy. I don't know any human being that it makes me sad. <laughs> and so I, I think that if we all in how we manage our life, try to do a few tweaks, uh, and if we get our friends and our neighbors and our co-workers do the same, we all can have a huge impact because I believe that there's an incredible you know, leverage that we can get for the system. Marco, you want to No, come? just reflect, I completely agree. Just reflect, you know, we bring, we live in a city and we bring plants inside our house. We bring animals and pets. We need that contact with nature. And I think that's the ultimate realization that we need to really get in our heads. We need nature much more than nature needs us. We are a little component of a big natural world, but we need the natural world, the contact, everything. And we, we were born in nature, we evolved in nature, we need the contact. Kids, take your, I remember my, the first time I took my son to see an animal, or I brought a, a, a cat in the house. The excitement, you know, there's nothing, very little things that can excite a kid, a young child more than an animal. And, uh, and, that's, uh, and that's in our genes, as you say, it's a natural reaction. Then we're losing that, we're losing that, it's because we become busy with our own kind of way of living. But we need to remember that. There's a beautiful um, little movie called The Nature Speaks. You should look up in, on, the, on YouTube. It's actually not from WBF, from another organization called the Conservation International. And at the end, Nature says, uh, because you know, uh, you think you are here to, s to save me, but actually this is not true because I can change, I can adapt. Can you speak into us? I think that's exactly what's all about. That's a, a, a wonderful quote on which I think we should probably close. And, but Marco again reminded us that we are not apart from nature. So the reason why we need nature because we, is of course we are part of it. So I think when, when we are responding to that call, when we're thinking what we can do, we have to continuously think about the fact that we are very much part of it. We are within it. Um, thank you very much to my panel. This was a terrific discussion. Thank you very much to all of you for your attention and fantastic questions from the audience. Thank you. We all have homework to do. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much.